Welcome to the podcast from Morningstar UK, the leading provider of investment news, views and analysis. This week, we're at the Morningstar Investment Conference, speaking with investment experts about the latest trends in the market and what risks and opportunities lie ahead. Our first guest today is Sebastian Leon, founder of Troy Asset Management, who warns investors they should be nervous about markets after quantitative easing and low interest rates have propped up stocks and bond prices. Hello, Sebastian. Hello, Emma. So we've just heard from you that we're finally at an end of cheap money. Quantitative easing is ending and it looks like interest rates are rising. What impact is this going to have on investors' portfolios? Well, I think we saw an initial sign of that in February when we saw a 9% sell-off in the US equity market uh, during the first week of February. Uh, It was a very sort of sudden, um, hard hit uh, after what had been a remarkably stable period for equity markets since the, since the end of 2016. Uh, we'd seen the lowest volatility that you know, we've experienced basically since the VIX index, the volati- volatility index, um, uh, came into fruition back in 1990. So um, I think that we're heading for a period uh, that's more challenging for investors. And I think in particular, uh, one of the issues is that we are looking at a period where yields are rising Um, equities have been buoyed by those very low interest rates um, that we've had for a long period of time. And so the equities and the bonds are moving to some extent in the same direction. Now, in the past, where a a balanced fund manager like myself, one has been able to hold bonds and equities as an offset to one another. So they've generated very good risk-adjusted returns, really for the last 35 years, for a very long time indeed. My concern is that we're going to an era where that is not going to be the case anymore, that equities bonds are not going to offer that mutual protection um, that they have done in the past. And we saw within the sell-off in February, actually bonds didn't do particularly well when equities didn't do it well either. So the the natural protections from an equity market sell-off are not there in the way that they were in the past. The answer for investors is actually to have a higher level of liquidity. Um, which after nine years of bull market, actually there aren't many people with liquidity, they are now fully invested. So I think that uh, to have some liquidity in order to exploit those opportunities of market falls, which I would anticipate over the next year or 18 months, um, is how you get some protection at least. Because diversity is no longer about, as you, as you say, just holding equities and bonds to balance one another out. Quantitative easing is kind of broken investing yes, 101. Absolutely. And you mentioned liquidity, but cash is incredibly low rates. Yeah. I mean, yeah. persuading people to hold more cash is yeah. going to be a difficult thing to do. So what is the answer? Is it gold? Uh, what well, other liquid, liquid assets are there? Well, certainly, I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't put people off holding a little bit of cash. Um, I know it, we're very aware that it yields very little, although it is yielding a little bit more. Obviously, in the US, um, yields, uh, yields are not unattractive, sort of 2%, uh, and, and two-year paper uh, yields um, a reasonable amount compared to, compared to the recent past. Um, so there are places, not very exciting places, to hide. Uh, but um, gold, I think, is pretty friendless at the moment. You know, it's well, well off its all-time high, unlike the stock market uh, and unlike the bond market. So um, I think gold has a role to play, um, both in terms of prote- protection from fat tail events. Um, so not just, it's not just about inflation and deflationary protection, um, but it's about geopolitical risk as well. So to have some gold that will make enough difference, there's no point in holding you know, 0 or 1%. You need to hold high single digits, maybe low double digits uh, amount to make an impact when things become difficult. Sebastian, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. With Sebastian urging caution, our next guest, Jupiter's James Clooney, tells Emma Ward the reasons to stay positive when stock markets look negative. Stock markets look overvalued across the spectrum, but how can you protect yourself against losses? Hello, James. Good morning, Emma. So, of course, you are going to say that now is the perfect time for absolute return funds because you are a manager of an absolute return fund. But it does look like the world is conspiring for something like this, something that's focused on capital preservation, to be a tool that investors really need right now. Yeah, I think in principle, this should be a good time for absolute return funds. But in practice, who knows? Because, you know, managers, active managers are as likely to make mistakes as they are to get things right. So I would say you've got to be careful. The managers have to be very thoughtful. And I'm not sure this is one of those moments where you go all in and sort of take one sided risk. I think you need to balance a lot of different possibilities and maybe tilt the portfolios and try and do sensible things. So it should be a good time for absolute return funds. Let's see. 
Unlike, say, a global equity fund manager, you have the ability to short things that you don't like. What is making you nervous at the moment? What assets are you saying, actually, you think they're going to drop? It seems as if almost everything's priced off low interest rates, whether it's bonds, equities, property, infrastructure. Uh, there are only a few outliers. Every now and then you say, well, maybe gold's not fully related. Maybe Russian equities are a little bit cheap. Uh, I looked the other year and I saw that Cincinnati residential property looked sensibly priced, but you know we can't all move to Cincinnati to exploit it. it, it there's a real limit to, to how many things look sensible. Most things look like they're priced off uh, an extreme set of conditions. In other words, they're fully or heavily priced. They're really expensive. And, and that makes me nervous because what could happen for maybe the first time in our careers is that almost everything falls at the same price. And that's going to be scary because the classic way of defending diversification isn't going to work. And it's like, wow, everything we've learned might prove to be useless. Uh, and so it's going to be a really exceptional set of circumstances if, if, if interest rates were to rise uh, dramatically from here. So you talked about my, uh, valuation there, which is a sort of bottom-up approach. Mm. But I know that, that top-down is also something that overlays your investment process. Mm. How important is the macro outlook to you? And, and how does it make you feel at the moment? I, I sometimes feel it's unforecastable. You know, we, we, we worry about stuff. We, we create a portfolio of stocks long and short, and then we say, look, we've got a, a lot of risk exposures. Then we say, what could go wrong? What if interest rates went up? What if they went down? What if the politics there deteriorated? What if there was a trade war? What if, you know, I, and there's no end to what you can, you can worry about. And we try to say, look, let's, let's, if there's cheap insurance for any of these, let's buy it. But actually, we can't make the portfolio invulnerable. But let's interlink it in such a way that we would lose a modest amount of money if, if we're wrong. Uh, and that's the best thing to do, to accept that you will sometimes misread the situation, that you will make modest losses, but keep them modest by blending things in. Um, and if you can buy cheap insurance uh, and, and, and hedge or even overhedge, you might end up going up a little bit in an environment that topples other people over. That's really useful for your clients. James, thank you very much. Thank you, Emma. Cheers. Next up, Mark Costa of J. O. Hambro Capital Management tells Emma Wall that misallocation of capital and failure to embrace technology harm companies more than economics. Hello, Mark. Hello. Mark. So we've just heard from you that the traditional influences on asset prices are perhaps not the ones that investors should be focusing on. If we can just run through the, the influences that people are currently obsessed with before we move on to the ones that you think are more important. Yes, I mean, I, th I think there's always a temptation to believe that if you can solve the latest macro conundrum, that that will unlock the key to successful investment performance. And of course, at the moment, that's Brexit or trade wars or even the state of the UK economy. And whilst I would love to offer good and precise answers to that question, the simple fact is I don't have the credibility or the skill set to do so. But I think it's very important in investment to focus on not what you would like to be good at, but what you like to think or what evidence suggests that you might have a competitive advantage in. So what we try to look at is what we think are much more powerful much more enduring and actually probably more significant longer term trends uh, to get right. And of course, in my, in my belief, that is capital allocation policies of companies, um, are they investing enough in their core franchise to create a sustainable platform for durable growth? Because there's a lot of companies, in our opinion, have been under investing and over distributing. And some of those are coming home to roost now, as we've seen with Capita or WPP or Microfocus. Um, we've seen dramatic changes in stock market ownership and technology driving markets as well. And that can lead to very outside price, move, outside price moves in both directions, which creates threats and opportunities. And of course, we're also in the middle of the, the midst of the most profound uh, technology revolution we're ever likely to see. Um, the pace of change has never been this fast, but it will never be this slow again, is what Justin Trudeau was saying at Davos uh, just a few months back, and I very much agree with him. That's creating tremendous opportunities for companies that are embracing that, are at the forefront of that. In some cases, that's the large-scale incumbent, that is the disproportionate beneficiary. And other, other times, it is the nimble disruptor that can, uh, that can capture the spores. And so it's very important to take a very discriminatory, fundamental bottom-up approach to looking at those individual examples. And I think you've hinted it there. It's not just about the, the companies that are embracing these new drivers and benefiting from them. But it's also about avoiding those that get it wrong. You mentioned WPP and Capita. Yeah. Are there any examples where, um, to your second point, the technology disruption is actually they've, they've fallen foul of? 
yes, I think WPP, for example, was looking to perhaps uh, overly focus on internal M&A and was distracted by the fact that consumer brands want to go direct to the individual individual and have that inherent relationship, bypassing the media agency or the PR agency and look to invest in the tools and techniques uh, to, to do that. Capita, um, you know, very successful BPO outsourcer back in the day, but technology has changed that industry. Um, you know, robotic process automation, bots, as a lot of people call them, can do a lot of the, the, the value add of an outsourcer. So by not, in, by not investing in that area, they, they've been competed away, and that's why they've been losing contracts, and that's why the business now needs to step up its capital investment program. And what about companies that have got it right, that have embraced these trends and are benefiting from them? Well, I think there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's several interesting examples. I mean, some of them are in the large cap area and some are in, in, in the small. I mean, one of the most, uh, very exciting ones for us is a company called First Derivatives. Um, in, in the Internet of Things. So that's when inanimate objects, machines or vehicles connect to the Internet. And of course they create a huge swathe and plethora of data, which is coming at very rapid velocity. That data needs to be controlled, managed and put in a format that can be analysed and acted upon, whether it's for predictive maintenance, whether it's for uh, future product development or efficiencies and enhancements. Now if you can crack that, that because almost every sector is, is starting to connect to the internet. The opportunities are profound and they are huge. First Derivatives via its KX technology has been investing consistently in R&D, in people, in systems. So we like to call it the 10 year overnight success story. You know, it hasn't just got here by chance, it's been investing consistently, which is the type of characteristics we look for, taking that long term approach. And that has left it with the most competitive, most powerful, and most interoperable uh, scalable database solution in the market, you know, even more powerful than Oracle and Amazon, for example, which is a pretty unique place to be for a UK technology company. Mark, thank you very much. OK. How do you profit from innovation? Is it just about investing in technology stocks? Interestingly, our next guest, Guinness fund manager Ian Mortimer, finds innovation through industrials and consumer stocks. Hello. Hi. So what does innovators mean? Because I imagine it's one of those titles that's rather open to interpretation for the fund manager. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it means different things to different people. Um, and I think what often people think is when you think of innovation, they think sort of small cap, very disruptive technology companies, which is obviously true. Uh, we take a much broader view of what we mean by innovation. And really what we're attempting to do is find companies doing something different or better or more innovative than their peers who would then have uh, a, a better growth path uh, going forward. Uh, and we don't think it's just technology companies. Uh, we think we can find innovation throughout industrials, consumer discretionary uh, and a wide range of uh, different sectors. How much does this play into the whole theme of disruption? Because it's quite a fashionable concept at the mm. moment with investment, picking those companies that are not just going to shake things up, but be the leaders within certain sectors going forward. Yeah, so the way we approach it is we, um, we come up with about 10 to 15 uh, themes uh, and they can stretch today from sort of artificial intelligence, driverless cars, uh, and we then try and find companies have exposure to those themes sort of from an economic perspective. Um, the second stage though we do is we say just because a company is innovative doesn't necessarily make it a good investment. And I think that's the difference. So we then screen that down a bit further, looking for things like good return on capital, a good balance sheet, uh, and then ultimately we're doing sort of bottom-up stock selection to say how are these companies growing. Uh, and we might think it's sort of, we sort of do it in three ways. One's kind of inventing, so you create a brand new product. Uh, the second is more to your point, kind of disruptive. You can move in and take market share. Uh, and the third element is sort of those leaders. Uh, so these are slightly larger companies that are more reinvesting, say, in their R&D or intellectual property to maintain their competitive edge versus their peers. And what's the turnover like on the fund? Because one imagines people who are innovators today probably weren't 10 years ago. Yeah, so actually we, we try and maintain a low turnover. Uh, so typically it's somewhere between uh, 20 and 30 percent of the names. And we run a pretty concentrated portfolio, so maybe 30 stocks uh, on an equally weighted basis. So it's quite different. Uh, and some of our holdings we've held for more than a decade uh, and others we've, you know, we've held for a shorter period. But we believe you know, we're not trying to find um, sort of very early stage venture capital type companies. Uh, we want companies with good cash flows, good balance sheets and ultimately earnings that we can understand. What about valuations? Because tech, I know not 
purely tech, but tech stocks in particular are famously highly valued. And it's all about kind of, is this multiple really reflecting the kind of growth one can expect as a shareholder going forward? Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, uh, the history of the strategy has been we've been doing this since 2003. Uh, and technology or the IT sector has been a good proportion of our funds. So on average, maybe it's 40 to 50 percent. Um, the way we kind of think about valuations is, is absolutely the same as you just described. It's balancing the valuation versus the potential growth prospects. Uh, and we would always say we sort of uh, approach growth with a valuation discipline. So when we're buying a company, we always want to see some prospect for a multiple expansion uh, for that business. So we're not purely just investing in growth for growth's sake, fingers crossed it comes through. We'd like to give ourselves some element of sort of that margin of safety idea. Um, and when you look at the valuation of the portfolio as a whole, uh, you know, for example, today it's only trading at a, say, 6 to cent uh, premium to MSCI World, despite having a 25% higher earnings growth expected. And what are the pitfalls, though? Because you don't have a crystal ball into, into the future. You can make informed guesses. There must be some innovators along the way that prove not to be. Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we can't get it right all of the time. Um, but I think one of the things we're trying to avoid is by having that sort of element of trying to see the quality of the business. So we've got companies with high returns or capital. We focus quite closely on the balance sheet strength, for example. So we tend to find um, the sort of the mistakes, if you like, we're making is companies don't grow quite as fast as we would like. Uh, maybe they slightly disappoint the market uh, and therefore that's reflected in the share price. What we don't tend to invest in is those sort of binary type companies. So yes, its products worked amazing or no, its product didn't work, and now it's actually sort of worth nothing. Um, so we're trying to avoid those sort of those binary type bets. Ian, thank you very much. Pleasure. A key theme at this year's Morningstar Investment Conference was artificial intelligence. What exactly is artificial intelligence, and how can investors profit from the innovation in computer learning? Hello, Jeremy. Hello. So it's a bit of a buzzword at the moment, AI, but what does it actually mean? That's a good question. It actually means many different things, and people use it as a catch-all to try and work out what they're talking about, really, because it includes machine learning, and it includes narrow AI and broader AI. So most people have encountered narrow AI, what they consider it to be, uh, with these chatbots that you talk to on your phone, and you think you're having a conversation with somebody, but you're not. That's very narrow. It's almost like a decision tree process. You can very easily fool them. Where we want to get to is uh, conversations with um, with computers or a network of computers that are actually feel like conversations. Now, one of the easiest ways to explain where we're going with artificial intelligence, which is basically just teaching a neural network of computers or a computer to learn on its own, is through um, is through visual identification or through you know, image processing. We're seeing that all the time. So, what they people, companies like Facebook have been doing is to try and teach computers how to recognize objects, classify them, identify them, and then put them in context, and that's the important thing. So they, their systems not only get as good as identifying cars and the make and the model of the year, but they can also say things like, this car is on the driveway of this house. And if you have ever dealt with a two or three year old child, those are actually quite complex sentences. Um, and you've got to remember this is the, um, the, the AI determining that for you. And so when these get more and more sophisticated, that's when you start to see companies start using AI, for example, to identify felons or uh, at um, football matches, which has happened in the UK, uh, or in China in stadiums, you know, identifying people with outstanding warrants and things like that. So that's the, the side where, you know, where a, humans cannot actually do that at scale and at speed, whereas AIs can. Artificial intelligence is essentially a way of crunching enormous amounts of data down into very, very simple things that you can understand. It does the heavy lifting, so you can then work out what to do with it. And you've mentioned there a couple of applications which, tend, which are on the side of kind of um, civil unrest. What about for the corporate world, not just in terms of financial services? As an investor, which companies are using it in a beneficial way to drive efficiency and therefore share prices? Well, actually, there's a really good one uh, called a company called Orbital Insights, which uses, combines artificial intelligence and satellite imagery to predict stock performance of companies. So it, it monitors 
um, the number of cars in the car parks in shopping malls and it monitors oil reserves, water reserves, agricultural performance and that's a huge amount of data. Again, you, crunching that enormous amount of data and using AI to actually simplify it so you could understand it. And they were successful in predicting a um, a rather large percentage downturn in cars at J.C. Penney shopping malls in the States and predicted um, the coming, which then actually did take place, the coming decline in stock price in the fourth quarter of last year. And then they ended up closing something like 130 stores. This was something that Orbital Insights used AI to predict before it actually was announced. Jeremy, thank you very much. Welcome. Next up, Ian McKenna of the Finance and Technology Research Centre says digitalising financial services can drive down costs and improve end investors' experience. So it's important that financial advisors embrace technology. Hello, Ian. Hello. So technology has disrupted and permeated so many other parts of the service industry, whether it be holidays or transport, but it seems to yet to have really disrupted financial services and particularly the advice market. Is that fair? To date, it's certainly fair. Um, but I think we are actually at the turning point. Um, one, one of the challenges, of course, is that people are dealing with long-term investments. So if somebody started contributing to a pension plan 25 years ago, um, there, there's a reason why one large insurance company has only recently uh, decommissioned a system called Pension 70. Um, you know, the, the legacy systems has, has helped things back. Um, but we are now a lot of work being done by investment providers, pension providers um, to upgrade their technology and make more information available uh, to both consumers and to advisors. So, And it's particularly important as well with targeting the retirees of the future because everything that they do is digitalised and so why shouldn't the way that they invest, the way that they engage with their advisor also be digitalised? Absolutely and, and that's been a major challenge with the financial services industry to get that industry to recognise that if you're not in you, if you're not using the chosen mechanism that the individual wishes to receive their information on, you're not actually in their line of sight. So those organisations who don't deliver those services can rapidly become out of sight and, and, and out of the picture. Um, conversely, I actually think it's really important for consumers to challenge the extent to which their financial advisors are using technology because if they're still receiving everything on paper the consumer's probably paying more than they should do because paper's expensive and time consuming to produce whereas the more advanced advice firms are now delivering information which can give consumers a holistic view of their savings on apps and other digital services. Because it's not just about ease of use, is it? It is about cost. So what, as an individual investor, should I be looking for from my advisor to make sure that they are prioritising technology and therefore cost? Well, I think a fair question to any advisor is how are they using technology uh, to drive down cost within their own businesses? Um, consumers will now, on, on new investments being made from the start of this year, of course we're seeing the MIFID rules come into, into practice, um, and there has to be an unparalleled level of transparency over all the charges that are being made to a consumer's contract. Um, in, in taking out new investments, they need to see explicitly stated in cash terms and percentage terms both the advice costs the investment management costs, the cost of any wrapper or product or, or platform, um, and any third party investment management services such as a discretionary fund manager, and be able to add all of those up and actually see how much they overall reduce the level of return. Now that's where we are today. From next year we'll have the so-called uh, ex-post reporting which will show actually year on year how much money has been taken out of their savings. 
that's going to be a, a real eye-opener, I think, to a lot of people. And um, it'll be really interesting to see which of the firms that are driving down cost and which of the firms that are just continuing to pass it on. Now, you've spoken here at the investment conference to a professional investor audience, and one of the slides that you showed was the um, disparity in the industry between those individuals or those firms that are embracing technology and those which say that they're not going to try technology because they know it won't work. <laughs> it's not very encouraging to hear from an individual investor point of view, but do you think we're moving in the right direction? Do you think that second pot of firms is just going to be left behind? I think it's a matter of... People should find the firm that works the way they want to. There are advisors um, that really want to con continue to work in traditional ways. And if that's what their customers want, fine. They're probably paying more than they need to. Um, but if that's what the customer wants and they're prepared to pay for it, fine. Alternatively, there are an increasing number. Um, one example is do you actually really need your financial advisor to come and visit you or do you need to visit them? The simple answer to that is you don't anymore and there are a growing number of financial advisors. Um, I can think of one example of a very successful advisor who will not meet clients in person. They meet face to face, they do uh, meetings over three different screen sharing platforms, Skype, SailMove and I can't remember the third one. But, so they're very effective at working with customers remotely, but the, the advisor doesn't have to come to them or vice versa. Um, and there's actually some really interesting uh, research that's been done that shows that a lot of customers prefer that. Ian, thank you very much. Thank you. What will happen to politics post-Brexit? Why was the Brexit vote such a shock to many? And will it spell the end or the beginning of populist politics? Professor Matthew Goodwin makes his predictions in our next interview. Hi Matthew. Hi. So we've just heard that the rise in populism is not going away any time soon, and yet it was such a shock to the institution, particularly here in London, when we voted for Brexit not that long ago. Well, indeed. I mean, I think the, the interesting macro question for all investors and analysts is when you look at things like Brexit or you look at things like Trump or what's happening in Europe, um, do these shocks represent the fact that we're at the end of a period of volatility and change, perhaps as older generations are replaced by sort of younger, millennial, tolerant uh, generations, you might argue? Or are, are these events actually telling us that we are near the beginning of a period of, of change and volatility? And I certainly th think it's more the latter than the former. And, and part of the problem that in our debate is we have too much groupthink in the sense that people are not interrogating thinking to the extent that they should be. If you look at the Brexit debate, you know, in my industry we had a, a, a big survey two weeks before the referendum that asked 300 opinion pollsters, uh, academics um, and journalists to predict the result uh, and over 90% said remain and the betting markets basically said remain and the telephone polls said remain. Um, and we, you know, if you go back you know, now, and you look at actually, well, the evolution of public opinion among those key groups, working class voters, um, people without degrees, um, you know, people who felt that they were being under, they were being squeezed by globalization and so on. Um, it was quite clear that the levels of distrust, levels of concern over those issues and also the issue of immigration could easily deliver a shock. But, you know, groupthink took over and, and we weren't interrogating uh, our own modeling and our own thinking as much as we should have been. And my big stick, if you like, is let's take a step back and look at those long-term trends, but let's look at how actually the West is changing more, more generally. And of course the decision making behind both Brexit and you know, the rise of Marina Pen in France, although she didn't win, and, and indeed Trump, is it's not about an economic market, an economic argument rather. You know, a lot of the confirmation bias that you talk of, we had definitely as a financial journalist, I was privy to a lot of that. But our discussion were about what's good for the economy, what's good for a free market, instead of being about emotive issues, which is what rise of populism really is about, isn't it? Yeah, I think we've had a very curious um, disconnect between the financial world and the political or social science world. And we've got one community that I think is still very much focused on rational choice and that this is about economic costs and benefits. And we've got another community that has been saying, well, concerns over identity and, and value conflicts are as important, if not more important, than people's sense of 
you know, economic performance. And we need to now actually get into a place where we're having these conversations together and we're actually bringing evidence on both sides together. Because it's certainly true, there are aspects of the Brexit uh, uh, moment and the Trump moment and the, what's happening in Europe now where, where economic uh, perceptions of loss or, or, or relative deprivation are important. They aren't the whole story, but they are there. But we also need to think about value conflicts within society, where they come from, how they're exacerbated. And we also need to think about generational changes as well. And, and unfortunately, much of the debate at the moment is focused quite narrowly on those short-term factors, You know what's happening in the markets right now, what the latest political leader said about X, Y, Z, and that distracts us from the longer-term trends. And you said at the beginning that you believe that we're at the beginning of a seismic shift towards this more populist politics. What does that mean, both in terms of Brexit and indeed across Europe, where we are still closely aligned? Yeah, so what I uh, have in my mind is I don't necessarily think that populist parties are going to be winning every election and sort of, you know, we're not going to have Brexits every year across the continent. But we are going to have quite a sharp rightward drift. And that is partly a response to the rise of these populist challenges. The mainstream parties, I think, will increasingly adopt much of the populist uh, policy platform and rhetoric, especially parties on the centre right. The centre left will increasingly struggle because it doesn't do very well on issues that relate to immigration and identity and it refuses to accept that these are anything more than just about economic scarcity and is being punished accordingly but more generally our politics will become more volatile and fragmented we know that rates of volatility generally are going up we know that rates of fragmentation the number of parties that are campaigning and contesting elections are going up and we know that voters are becoming what we would call as political scientists de-aligned from the party system we know that they are less likely than they were in earlier decades to say I'm loyal to the mainstream and that means we're all going to be navigating this period of a more sort of fluid period chaotic slightly unpredictable period uh, together. Professor Goodwin thank you very much. Will US tax reform lead to growth or inflation? Will Donald Trump's proposed tax reform in the US prolong the economic cycle or cause inflation to jump? We asked JP Morgan's market strategist Karen Ward. Hello Karen. Morning. So I've just listened to your presentation. I thought we could focus on the US. It's a very interesting slide that showed the sort of the disassociation between growth in the US and the amount of spending that is about to be done. Yes, exactly. So the US administration's announced not only an enormous government spending package, but obviously this great big tax reform. Um, that's going to push the budget deficit towards around five and a half percent over the next two years. But I think what's complicated the issue for markets is whilst this sounds great, that's more growth, we have never seen a fiscal stimulus of this size at a time when the economy is already doing very well, when unemployment is already low. So it raises so many interesting questions. How is this going to prolong the US economic cycle? It might mean that actually it gives us another couple of years of very strong growth. Um, if we see productivity come back, if we see that participation rate in the labor market continue to rise, then that will actually come through in additional growth, which is obviously great news for markets. At the same time, there is a risk that it turns up in inflation. And of course, what that means then is, whilst the US administration are giving with one hand in fiscal stimulus, the Federal Reserve will be taking away with the other hand in higher interest rates. So that's why the market's a bit schizophrenic about how to interpret this additional stimulus. And you said the key Fridays to be watching were the jobs figures, because we've already seen it this time, th this year. We saw the jobs figures be better than expected, and the whole world went into meltdown for a few days, didn't it? Exactly. We saw wage growth pick up one month to 2.9%, just a point three percentage point increase. I mean, pretty modest, still low by historical standards. But at the same time, the US 10-year rose 30 basis points, the equity market was down 10%. So this sensitivity to higher interest rates, what that means for stocks is absolutely acute. And we're just going to be watching that payrolls number each Friday to see what extent wage growth is actually coming back. And as I say, whether this stimulus is showing up in growth, good, or showing up in inflation, not so good. And why do you think it caused such volatility? Because you've mentioned the US reaction, but it wasn't US centric. You know, I'm based in Hong Kong, the Asia markets fell considerably, European markets fell considerably. We know that this is an unnaturally low bond environment, and yet the idea of bond yields rising is still quite shocking. I think the, you're right that there is this 
I think, a gut feeling in many investors' minds that when the central banks were pumping money in, markets went up. So therefore, if the central banks are taking money out, markets will go down. And they sort of can't get over that idea that that's, that's the relationship. But you know, I think we've got to remember that the reason the central banks were operating so aggressively is the natural spirits in the economy were non-existent. Companies, households were not willing to spend, and they were being forced to through lower interest rates. So for me, an environment where those animal spirits are coming back, where households and businesses want to spend, fine, we don't need low interest rates. The economies and therefore earnings and therefore the stock market should do perfectly well in that environment. Karen, thank you very much. Thank you. And that's the end of this edition. We hope you enjoyed this programme. From everyone here at Morningstar UK, thanks for listening.